This is our uh, topic for this session is the new witness for Christ. <clears throat> Let me begin with a statement or two by our living prophet, President Benson. <clears throat> the Book of Mormon, he says, was written for us today. God is the author of the book. It is a record of a fallen people, compiled by inspired men for our blessings. These people never had the Book of Mormon. It was not meant. It was, it was meant for us. It's a digest of the spiritual experience of the Nephite people. He goes on to say, Grave consequences hang on our response to the Book of Mormon. Those who receive it in faith, said the Lord, and work righteousness shall receive the crown of eternal life. But those who harden their hearts in unbelief and reject it, it shall turn to their own condemnation. For the Lord God hath spoken it. It is the Book of Mormon. Is the Book of Mormon true? Yes. Who is it for? Us. What is its purpose? To bring men to Christ. How does it do this? By testifying of Christ and revealing uh, his enemies. How are we to use it? We are to get a testimony of it. We are to teach it. We are to hold it up as a standard. Have we uh, been doing this? Not as we should, nor as we must. Do eternal consequences rest upon our response to this book? Yes, either to our blessings or to our condemnation. Every Latter-day Saint should make the study of the Book of Mormon a lifetime pursuit. Otherwise, he is placing his soul in jeopardy and neglecting that which could give spiritual and intellectual unity to his whole life. There is a difference between a convert who is built on the rock of Christ through the Book of Mormon and stays hold on that iron rock and one who does not. You can tell the flavor. There's a difference. Over a quarter of a century ago, I listened to the tabernacle. I listened in the tabernacle to these words. <clears throat> a few years ago, as I began to practice law, and he's quoting Marion G. Romney, members of my family were a little uneasy. They were afraid I would lose my faith. I wanted to practice law, but I had an even greater desire to keep my testimony, and so I decided upon a little procedure which I recommend to you. For thirty minutes each morning before I began the day's work, I read from the Book of Mormon. And in just a few minutes a day, I read the Book of Mormon through every year for nine years. I know that it kept me in harmony, so far as I did keep in harmony with the Spirit of the Lord. It will hold us as close to the Spirit of the Lord as anything I know. Now, these are some comments from President Benson, we all know. To what extent he has been stressing that we make the Book of Mormon more fully and completely the basis of our lives. In the Book of Mormon, Nephi and Ezekiel were contemporaries, uh, and they had one thing in common. They both had a vision of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon as a new witness for Christ and as a divine instrument by which Israel would be gathered and reestablished in the last days. While Nephi was traveling southward through the Arabian desert and located in the land called Bountiful, Ezekiel was taken captive about 598 B.C. and carried captive into Babylon, where the Lord showed him many things about the last days. In Ezekiel chapter 37, Ezekiel wrote of God's word to him about the stick of Judah and the stick of Joseph. Now, we're all familiar with this passage, but I would like to read it to you from the New English Translation, which uses archaeological findings of a recent date to better understand and better interpret. Ezekiel's statement. And so I read then from the New Translation. You can start with uh, verse 15 of Ezekiel 37 and read along with me if you would like. From the New Standard Translation then, These were the words of the Lord unto me. 
make man take one leaf of a wooden tablet and write on it, Judah and his associates of Israel. Take then another leaf and write on it, Joseph, the leaf of Ephraim, and all his associates of Israel. Now bring the two together to form one tablet. Then they will be a folding tablet in your hand. When your fellow countrymen ask you to tell them what you mean by this, say to them, These are the words of the Lord. I am taking the leaf of Joseph, which belongs to Ephraim, and his associate tribes, and joining to it the leaf of Judah. Thus I shall make them one tablet, and they shall be one in my hand. The leaves on which you write shall be visible in your hands for all to see. Then say unto them, These are the words of the Lord God. I am gathering up the Israelites from their place of exile among the nations. I will assemble them from every quarter and restore them to their own soil. Some people read Ezekiel 37 about the sticks, and they say, these sticks are not written documents, but uh, recent archaeological findings make it evident that Ezekiel was writing about actual records, records of Joseph and records of, of Judah, and that they would be brought together in the last days, and then they would be the instrument in the hands of the Lord in the great work of gathering and redeeming Israel, which is the marvelous work and a wonder, as referred to by the Book of Mormon. Now, while Ezekiel then is a captive in Babylon was shown these things, Nephi was given a great vision in which he saw the discovery of America and its early colonists. Speaking then of the early Americans, Nephi wrote, and I'm quoting here now from 1 Nephi chapter 13, beginning with verse 20. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld, now he's seen prior to this, the uh, discovery of America by Columbus. And he's seen also the coming of the American colonists to America, both being motivated by the Spirit of the Lord. And you don't have to hassle that one. Columbus maintained an ardent, an defiant, really, testimony when people crossed him, that he was shown the way and given the confidence and the assurance by the Holy Ghost in making the discovery of America. And then, when you analyze the origins of American society and the early colonists, while they went forth out of captivity, which is what may be called an expulsive factor, something that expelled them, nevertheless they were guided by the Spirit. And uh, the historical documentation on that is overwhelming. There simply is no issue on that. But having seen them, then, Nephi writes about them in verse 20, it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld that they did prosper in the land. Behold, a book. I beheld a book, and it was carried forth among them. And the angel said unto me, Knowest thou the meaning of the book? And I said unto him, I know not. And he said, Behold, it proceedeth out of the mouth of a Jew. And I, Nephi, beheld it, and he said unto me, The book that thou beholdest is the record of the Jews, which contains the covenants of the Lord, and it's talking about the Old Testament there which he hath made unto the house of Israel, and also containeth many of the prophecies of the holy prophets, and it is a record like unto the engravings which are upon the plates of brass, save there are not so many. Nevertheless, they contain the covenants of the Lord, which he hath made unto the house of Israel, wherefore they are of great worth unto the Gentiles. And the angel of the Lord said unto me, Thou hast beheld that the book proceeded forth in the mouth of the Jew, and when it proceeded forth in the mouth of the Jew, it contained the plainness of the gospel. The Old Testament contains the plainness as well as the new. Of whom the twelve apostles then bear record, and they bear record according to the truth which is in the Lamb of God. Wherefore, these things go forth from the Jews in purity in the Gentiles according to the truth which is in God. 
And after they go forth by the hand of the twelve apostles of the Lamb from the Jews and the Gentiles, thou seest the formation of a great and abominable church, which is most abominable of all other churches. And behold, they have taken away from the gospel of the Lamb many parts which are plain and most precious, and many covenants of the Lord have they taken away also. So there's two things there. Many parts uh, of the gospel of the Lamb refers to the New Testament, and many covenants refers to the Old Testament. And it's talking then about uh, uh, taking elements of both of them from the record, which uh, is a vital record. Now, having seen these things, Nephi was uh, uh, given to understand that he and his posterity would be instrumental in giving the world the pure gospel of salvation. To Nephi, for example, let's turn over to verse 34 on this one. <clears throat> to Nephi the Lord said, And it came to pass that the angel spake unto me, saying, Behold, thus saith the Lamb of God, after I have visited the remnant of the house of Israel, and the remnants of whom I speak is the seed of thy father. Wherefore, after I have visited them in judgment, and smitten them by the hand of the Gentiles, and by the Gentiles... Uh, and after the Gentiles rather do stumble exceedingly because of the most plain and precious parts of the gospel of the Lamb, which have been kept back by the abominable church, which is the mother of the harlots, saith the Lord, I will be merciful unto the Gentiles in that day, insomuch that I will bring forth unto them in mine own power much of my gospel, which shall be plain and precious, saith the Lamb. And then he goes on and says, And behold, saith the Lamb, I will manifest myself unto thy seed, and they shall write many things, which I shall minister unto them, which shall be plain and precious. And after thy seed shall be destroyed, and dwindle in unbelief, and also the seed of thy brethren, behold, these things shall be hid up to come forth unto the Gentiles by the gift and power of the Lamb. And in them shall be written my gospel, saith the Lamb, and my rock, and my salvation. So the Lord then promises uh, Nephi that, that the writings of Joseph would finally come forth from him uh, and from his posterity. And then he adds the interesting point that there would be other records come forth. In verse 39 and 40, for example, And after it had come forth unto them, that is, after it the Bible had come forth unto them, I beheld other books which came forth by the power of the Lamb from the Gentiles unto them, and to the convention of the Gentiles, and the remnant of the seed of my brethren, and also the Jews who were scattered upon all the face of the earth, that the records of the prophets and of the twelve apostles of the Lamb are true. And the angel spake unto me and said, These last records, and it's plural, these last records which thou hast seen among the Gentiles shall establish the truth of the first. Now, the last records to which he refers then includes the doctrine and covenants. It includes, for example, the book of Abraham. It includes the prophet's inspired revision of Moses. And if you read carefully section 6 of the Doctrine and Covenants, section 8 and section 9, the Lord there makes it very clear in the prophet Joseph's day that even then he wanted to bring forth other records than the Book of Mormon. For example, Oliver Cowdery comes on the scene, and uh, in his association with the prophet Joseph Smith, he is given jointly with the prophet the keys of translation. And uh, as he receives these keys, then he uh, is uh, informed that not merely the Book of Mormon, but that other records will come forth. Verse 25 of section 6, Behold, I grant unto you a gift, if you desired of me, to translate even as my servant Joseph. Verily, verily, I say unto you, there are records which contain much of my gospel, which have been kept back because of the wickedness of the people. And now I command you that if you have good desire, desire to lay up treasures for yourself in heaven, then shall you assist in bringing to light with your gift those parts of my gospel which have been hid up because of iniquity. Now, behold, I give unto you and also to my servant Joseph the keys of this gift that shall bring to light this ministry, and in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall all things be established. I want to come back to that in a minute, but just let me turn with you first of all over to section 8 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Now, section 8 and 9 are two revelations directed toward Oliver Cowdery when he tried to uh, 
He used the gift of translation which the Lord had given to him. And uh, the Lord uh, tells him about the spirit of revelation in verse 2 and 3, because it's through the spirit of revelation that he is to translate. It's not merely an intellectual process. It's, it's a Syriac gift, at least as the prophet used it, and it's revelatory in its nature. <clears throat> he says, for example, in verse 1, Even so surely uh, shall you receive a knowledge of whatsoever things you shall ask in faith with an honest heart, believing that you re- shall receive a knowledge uh, concerning the engravings of old records which are ancient, which contain those parts of my scripture which have been spoken by the mouth of my, by the manifestation of my spirit. And then he defines the spirit of revelation and tells Oliver that he has a special gift to bring those things forth. And Oliver then uh, is given in connection with this, he is given an instrument by which to translate. And uh, to see the full meaning of this, let me turn to a copy of the, of the Book of Commandments, and I have a photographic copy here, and I'm reading now from section 8, and uh, the verse is verse 3 in this document, it's verse 5 in the Book on the Doctrine and Covenants. O oh, remember these words and keep my commandments, remember this is your gift. Now, this is not all, for you have another gift, which is the gift of working with the rod. Behold, it has told you things. Behold, there is no other power save God that can cause this rod of nature to work in your hands. And uh, he says, For it is a work of God, and therefore whatsoever you shall ask me to tell you by that means. That will I grant unto you, that ye shall know. Remember that without faith you can do nothing. Trifle not with these things. Do not ask uh, uh, for things which you ought not. Ask that you may know the mysteries of God, and that you may translate all those ancient, those ancient records, which have been kept hid up, which are sacred, and according to your faith shall it be done unto you. Okay? Now, Oliver didn't live up to this privilege and this gift and this opportunity. And it may be that had he done so, we might have a little more than what we have. When you think of what the prophet was put through by the, uh, uh, by the betrayal of false brethren, or men the brethren who became false brethren, and the trials they put him through, the episodes of Missouri, the Missouri imprisonment, and the uh, uh, driving of the saints out of, out of the state of Missouri, and all that that entailed in extra administrative details and extra labor and extra activity. And men then who had been faithful and stood with the prophet, leaving him and forsaking and bearing false witness and false testimony against him, it's a little wonder that we got as much as we did get in the way of revelation. Had there been... Uh, true faith and true commitment and true dedication, we might have a different picture to tell. The point is, Oliver is told that he can use this gift. Now, this gift is a rod. It's called the rod of nature. And because Oliver bungled this, if I can put it that way, the prophet Joseph Smith himself, in the 1835 edition, of the Revelations, the first copy of the Book of, of the Doctrine and Covenants, made some alterations. He talks about this rod as the gift of Aaron, and he says, Behold, it has told you many things. I'm reading now from the regular Doctrine and Covenants. Behold, there is no other power, save the power of God, that can cause this gift of Aaron to be with you. Therefore doubt not, for it is a gift of God, and you shall hold it in your hands. Now, it's an instrument, so it's something that he can hold. Now, we don't know too much about that. The best thinking on it is this, that with the plates, the prophet had what we called the breastplate, as well as the Urim and Thumb, and uh, the Leahona. And these items and so forth then were a part of the sacred uh, items in the repository there on uh, the Hill Cumorah. Now, the breastplate then 
fit over the breast here and had uh, a shoulder strap that went across. Mother Smith said the strap was just that wide, she's because I measured it with my fingers. And uh, so however wide her fingers was, it was that wide, see? And it fastened then to a person's uh, chest. Now, President Brigham Young indicated that the breastplate had the same spiritual qualities as did the Urban Thummim. And the Urban Thummim then was set in what we call a silver bowl. They were uh, uh, triangular-shaped uh, uh, materials, crystal color and so forth, set in a bowl. In other words, you got the glasses here and you and you, you set it in a bowl so that it held together. And over here on the side was a little notch, and down in the breastplate a little notch, something like an old buggy whip thing on a, on, a, on a buggy, you know. You put the buggy whip in it, see? You put the rod in there, attach it here, and you have it before your face, and then you have your hands free. Now, that's at least the best thinking on it. But apparently this rod had special spiritual qualities and powers. In the historical department of the church, there's a letter that uh, Hiram Smith's uncle Jesse wrote to him in the spring of 1829. Now, Jesse is a brother of Joseph Smith, Sr., and of Uncle John Smith, who became uh, a patriarch in the church and one of the faithful leaders of the church of put on out here into Utah. But Jesse became violently opposed. Uh, to the gospel, so much so that he could hardly even stand members of his family in his home who believed in it. And he just literally became uh, wild in his thinking and his attitude and his disposition. Apparently, Hiram Smith had written to him at that time telling him and persuading him, if he could, uh, to believe the story of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. And in Hiram Smith's letter, apparently, he had mentioned this rod and the powers that it had. And so Jesse uh, writes back bitterly, vehemently, violently, condemning him and just literally reading him the riot act. And in the midst of these uh, uh, unsavory comments, he says, you claim to have a rod by which you can measure the distance from one point to another through the spheric power of God. See? Uh, so he confirms, at least, that there was such an instrument there. Now, apparently, this instrument was entrusted to Oliver Cowdery, who received the keys of translation jointly with the prophet Joseph Smith. And apparently, it was through this instrument that he made the effort to translate. Now, how that modified the picture as against using the Urban Thummim, we don't know. But uh, the Lord tells him very clearly, Ask not that you, may, uh, that, that you may translate and receive knowledge concerning all those records. He's merely saying, Use this gift, which is the gift uh, called the rod of Aaron. It's the rod like Aaron had, if not the same one. And he was to use that then as an instrument by which to translate. And then when he failed, because he merely thought that he could just say, Lord, here I am, and I'll start dictating, then the Lord came back in section 9 and gives us this important revelation. When someone tells you you, do, you need to do a section 9 on your problem, well, that has reference to this section and the Lord's counsel to think things through, study them out, pray about it, and then feel the response of the Spirit. And so he tells that. But in connection with those instructions of correction to Oliver, since he hadn't done that, then the Lord says this in chapter verse 1. Behold, I say unto you, my son, that because you did not translate according to that which you desired of me, and did commence again to write to my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., even so I would that ye should continue until you have finished this record which I have entrusted unto him. Now, that's the Book of Mormon. And then, behold, other records have I, that I will give unto you power that you may assist to translate. Now, it may be that this has reference, for example, to the book of Abraham, a small fraction of which the prophet was able to publish, and we have five chapters worth in the Fuller Prize. The prophet also had a document or a record called the book of Joseph. The ancient patriarch Joseph was a part of that material. But due to the press of circumstances on him and all of that, then he was only able to give us this later record. As I say, uh, 
the uh, Lord works within the agency of men. And had men like Oliver Cowdery been steadfast and true and faithful, given Joseph the support he should have had, we might have a little different picture than what we have. On the other hand, the fact that we don't have it seems to uh, be a just measure to us. We don't really study and apply ourselves too much to learn what we do have, let alone have those other things. So I, I'll repent of that, but, but I have thought of it. I want you to know. So uh, as, we, as we consider now this, this new witness for Christ, this new witness, this note, for instance, that it's uh, uh, the Book of Mormon, this Nephite record that the Lord intended other records, but let's put Oliver Cowdery in his place there. And his place, not ultimately, but at least initially, was one where he was given the keys of translation jointly with Joseph, and he stood as a dual witness in the translation. Again, section 6, verse 28, and in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Now, this is the beginning of Oliver Cowdery's position in the church, and this became a very, very important position. He came through the Lord's mercy, despite his weaknesses, to stand as an associate head of the dispensation of the fullness of times, so that he stood jointly with the prophet Joseph in holding the keys of this dispensation. And this joint program then began to be centered in him as he went from Palmyra, where he had been teaching school. Uh, through that uh, winter of, of uh, 28 and 9, and finally arrived uh, in Harmony, Pennsylvania, on a Sunday early in April, helped the prophet Joseph Smith with some work around the yard and the farm on Monday, and then Tuesday began to act as the prophet's scribe in the translation of the Book of Mormon. And uh, in association with that, then given the keys of translation jointly with Joseph Smith, and was to stand as a witness with Joseph of that record. Now, as things unfolded when the Aaronic priesthood was restored, then Oliver Cowdery again received that priesthood jointly with the prophet Joseph. And when the Melchizedek priesthood was restored, somewhere about halfway between Harmony, Pennsylvania and Colesville, uh, New York, a distance of about 30 miles or so, as they were fleeing from a mob, having gone to Colesville to visit some of their friends. And as morning arose, arrived, as they had been wallowing through the brush and the mire and so forth all night long, and they sat on the log, and Oliver, in exasperation, said, Joseph, how long must we endure these tribulations and trials? And at that time, then, Peter and James, as resurrected beings, and John, as a translated being, appeared to them and conferred upon them the holy Melchizedek priesthood and the holy apostleship. And all of them received this jointly with the prophet. Now, he had some difficulties. He ran before he was sent in the practice of plural marriage, and he got things into difficulty there, and he began to lose the spirit. But the Lord nevertheless hung in with him, and uh, he was there at Kirtland in, in April of 1836, when the great keys and powers of the Holy Order, the uh, Sacred Temple Family Order, the Family of Christ for Eternity, centering in Christ and in its capstone of eternal marriage and the sealing powers, when these were restored. With the gathering of Israel and the appointments given by the Lord initially to Abraham and then restored uh, and the seating power by Elijah to seal families together, then Oliver received this, this, uh, these appointments jointly with the prophet. So that he stood as a dual head of this dispensation. And then, because he finally lost the spirit, and he did have it to a great degree, Wilford Woodruff says, the first time I met Oliver. Uh, and associated with him in that early period of time, he had such an endowment of the Spirit that when he walked, it seems that the earth trembled under his feet. He had a real endowment of the Spirit, but then he became proud. 
There was an element of pride in him. And uh, President Benson's article on pride, by the way, is, is one of the great classic arguments, uh, art articles of religious history. It ranks up there uh, very near to the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, it's one of the great articles. We need to read it and uh, study it. And as we do, we find that it applies to all of us, believe me, every one of us. We all have reason, then, uh, to ponder uh, that great document which our living prophet today has given to us. And but Oliver then lost this, and he went into apostasy. And as a result of his apostasy, he was cut off from the church and uh, wandered around in the legal profession for a while, <clears throat> and then finally uh, came back into the church, went to Canesville in Ohio, uh, there asked for readmittance to the church, and was there baptized, and then wanted to come west, but decided he wanted to visit some friends before he did so. And so he went to visit some friends. and. In the course of that visit, he became ill and prayed and died. Now, in the meantime, he had come back into the church, but the Lord had transferred the position of responsibility that he had to another man. And you have that transfer recorded here in section 124 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And here, for example, uh, the Lord speaking now to Hiram Smith. And as this revelation was given, Hiram had been serving as a counselor in the First Presidency. Hiram and uh, Sidney Rigdon were counselors to the Prophet Joseph Smith in the, first, in the First Presidency of the Church. And in verse 91 of section 124, the Lord then gives some instructions. And again, verily I say unto you, let my servant William, that's William Law, who had been a convert from up in, in Canada, and who uh, was rather affluent and, uh, in many ways, a very gifted individual. And yet William Law then became one who perpetrated, and very probably the chief perpetrator of the martyrdom. He says, Let my servant William be appointed, ordained, and anointed as counselor unto my, jo unto my servant Jodas in the room of my servant Hiram, that my servant Hiram may take the office of priesthood and patriarch which was appointed to him by his father, by blessing and also by right. See, the office of the patriarch to the church comes down by lineal rights. And when Joseph Smith Sr. died, and he had before this revelation was given, then Hiram Smith <clears throat> had the right to that office. And so what the Lord did then was take him out of the First Presidency as a counselor and make him the patriarch of the church. But that's not the end of the story. He goes on to say, uh, Henceforth he may hold the keys of patriarchal blessings, referring back to that initial calling, that whosoever he blesses shall be blessed, and whosoever he shall curse shall be cursed, that whosoever he shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever he shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. But then verse 94 starts out with the little word and, and it means that there's something more coming. There's another appointment besides the patriarch of the church. He says, And from this time forth I appoint unto him that he may be a prophet and a seer and a revelator unto my church, as well as my servant Joseph, that he may act in concert also with my servant Joseph, that he may achieve, he shall receive counsel from my servant Joseph, who shall show unto him the keys, and this is important and relates then to the temple and the sacred rites of the temple, and he show him uh, the keys whereby he may ask and receive and be crowned, note, with the same blessings and glory and honor and priesthood and gifts of the priesthood that once were put upon him that was my servant, Oliver Cowdery. And so Hiram Smith then was given by special appointment the office of associate president of the church and associate head of the dispensation of the fullness of times. And uh, in this then received the same appointment that otherwise would have been Oliver Cowdery's had he been faithful. I once heard President Joseph Fielding Smith, it was years ago, when he was on BYU campus, 
talking about all of the Calgary verses, uh, his uh, grandfather Hiram Smith, and uh, making the point that I've made here that uh, that Hiram Smith was given these the same appointments that Oliver Cowdery had initially received. And then he went on to suggest the following. He said, had Oliver Cowdery remained faithful, he and not Hiram Smith would have died with the prophet Yoda Smith in the Carthage jail. And then he gives us this interesting testimony. He says, I once made this observation in the presence of Heber J. Grant, who was then president of the Church. And he says, when I got through with my talk on the subject, President Grant stood up and says, I affirm and sanction and confirm as being true and correct that which Yoda Fielding Smith has said about his grandfather Hiram Smith, that uh, had uh, Oliver remained faithful, then uh, Hiram Smith I mean, Oliver, rather than Hiram, would have died with him in the Carthage jail as a testimony, sealing a dual testimony, sealing then the testimony of this dispensation. But Hiram then played that role, became faithful, and remained faithful, and this, contrary to all other people who stood next to the prophet, it is an interesting fact that of all the men who associated with Yoda Smith in the first presidency, there was only one who was faithful to the end, and that was Hiram. Sidney Rigdon, Frederick G. Williams, William Law, and there's another guy that I can't remember now. I don't think anyone else does. Pardon? Yeah, that's right. Thank you. And he was in long enough to have them say, we would like you to receive the calling, and what did he do? He flew the coop. And we don't know anything about the guy. He's called to be a counselor of the First Presidency, and very few people know about it. And I had even forgotten it. Maybe that's symbolic. We ought to forget the guy anyway. <laughs> but that's not that I'm significant in that way, but maybe just a symbol of the saints. <laughs> but the point is that, uh, that only one stood faithful to the prophet, and that was his brother Hiram. And Hiram was probably the one man who was closest to the prophet, and who shared most intimately with him all the events and activities of bringing forth the work in this dispensation. He was probably the one man who was most faithful. And in eternity, then, he will stand with the prophet in the holding of those keys. Now, as we talk about the coming forth, then, of the of the Book of Mormon and the uh, Oliver Cowdery's role and relationship in it. <clears throat> Let me turn to what we call the lost manuscript of the uh, Book of Mormon. Actually, we're talking about a unit of the translation of of uh, Joseph of the uh, abridgment of Mormon. When Mormon compiled his record, he started out. <coughs> And the first unit of material that was on the abridged record that Joseph Smith had was a book called the Book of Lehi. And when translated, this included or was contained in 116 pages on fool's cap paper, which Joseph Smith, as translator, and Martin Harris, as his scribe, produced. And then, as we know the story, Martin began to agitate because of uh, the difficulties he was having with his wife, and she was uh, the dominant personality in the relationship. Martin always had the last word, which was, yes, honey. <laughs> but uh, and I don't say that. With, uh, I apologize. <laughs> but uh, Sister Harris became very much involved. She went to the prophet Joseph and says, now, if you've got those records, and my husband says you do, keep in mind I'm, I'm kind of running affairs in our home, and if you'll show those to me and satisfy me in relation to those, I'll put the wealth and, and power of the Harris estate behind you, and we'll really go to town. 
We'll really do it. We'll do it up front. And the prophet uh, kindly but firmly says, well, you know, Sister Lucy, I would prefer working with your husband. And that's the worst thing he could have said, but he couldn't say anything else. And uh, as a result, then, she became very bitter. And when uh, the prophet uh, transcribed some materials from the records in preparation for all of, for Martin to come to Harmony and pick them up and take them to certain learned linguists in the East, then she was going to go with him. And uh, she uh, didn't quite have that privilege and opportunity. He sneaked out the back door, went down the road a ways in another direction, and headed out. And that really made things rough. And so when he came back after visiting with the linguists, then she had moved things out of their bedroom and had him a, a dog house in which he could live. And, and it was that kind of a strange relationship. And then the prophet went, and then Martin, rather, went down to visit the prophet to help him translate. And this time he, he couldn't get away without her. Meantime, Martin was a very talkative and boastful individual. And uh, he was honest. He was just known as a man of strict honesty, but uh, he didn't know quite how to control his tongue. And he was boastful. And he was out to get those guys in Palmyra who had said so many uncouth things about him. And now he had this document, the transcript of the Book of Mormon, that he had taken back east. And so while he would visit around, then he'd haul that transcript out and show them, and then when they couldn't have an answer, then he'd pour salt in the wounds and badger them, see? And that kind of stirred things up a little bit. That stirred things up. But meantime, his wife Lucy also got in the act because she was used to running the show, and, it was, and, and Martin had one upper on her. He had, he had that document. And it so happened that they had a very lovely daughter, also named Lucy, and she had a very handsome suitor who was seeking for her hand in marriage. And uh, Mother Hare said to this good brother, I'll look favorably upon your intentions if you will do something for me. And he says, you name it, and I'll do it, you know, the valiant knight. <clears throat> And she says, now my husband has that transcript, and I'd like to have a copy of it. Can you get that for me? And so he gets into good graces of Martin and, and somehow gets copy, uh, access to it and copies a copy off and gives to her. And that creates a little scenario because when Martin's out showing this thing to people and then boasting about it, just at the point he was going to make his point and uh, uh, get his two bits in, and then Lucy would kind of move him aside and says, now, he's not so great. I've got a copy. Let me show you. <clears throat> and then she'd take the conversation over. And it was that kind of a relationship. And when Martin then went back down to Harmony to help the prophet translate, uh, then he couldn't get away without her. And when they got there, the first thing she did was start ransacking the place. And she started at one end of the house, and fortunately that was the other end where the plates were, and the prophet sneaked the plates out and took them out in the woods and buried them. And she ransacked the house from top to bottom and then went out into the yard, and it was winter time. and she trudged through the snow and ransacked everything she could and finally come in cold and bitter and uh, drew the conclusion there was no such thing as any records. And with that then, she flew the coop and went up and down the neighborhood telling people that Joe Smith was deceiving her husband with the intent to get some of their property. And on the way home she went, telling the same story. Now, under those circumstances, then Martin and Joseph sit down to translate. And when they get the book of Lehi translated, then Martin has had the feedback on this, because the neighbors have come in. And uh, there's a report back of what his wife is doing, even back there at Palmyra. So there's that kind of report coming in. And so he wants to allay the situation. He wants to pour oil on troubled waters. To pour oil on troubled waters. And so he says, now, Joseph, you go ask the Lord, we can't take this manuscript. Now, let me take it home and show her and some of these others, and we'll show them that we're not involved in something that's uh, wild and fanatic, see. 
And so the prophet asks, and the Lord says, No. And uh, Oliver Cowdery mumbles and grumbles. And finally he comes back to Joseph and says, You go tell the Lord that he doesn't know my wife like I do. You know, we've got a problem on our hands. And you ask him again. And so Joseph went and asked him, because there was a critical situation, see. And then uh, the Lord again says no. And finally then, with a few more reports coming in, Martin then really puts pressure on the situation. Now you go ask. And I've been involved here, and my time is involved in all of that. Now I have some right to this. Now you go ask. And so the prophet then yields to that persuasion. And this time the Lord says, okay, provided you only show those this manuscript to a limited few people, and they were specified as to who they were. And uh, with that then, Martin makes the covenant that this would be the case, and he takes the manuscript and heads for home. Now as he goes along the road, he finds a friend, and as the friend approaches to him, he begins to grin and sneer. And uh, he's got a sly look in his face, in his eye, and he says, Martin, I understand you're really involved. It's not edited things. <laughs> well, how could you do that, Martin? <laughs> and it just really rubs Martin the wrong way. And uh, with the element of pride that's there, then he gets his uh, Irish up and, and uh, says, hey, we are not involved in something, and I'll show you, see. And so out comes the manuscript. I'll show you. And then when he gets home, that same routine goes. And then he's not content to let it be at that. He's out boasting to them, this Book of Mormon is going to overthrow modern Christendom, etc., 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 see? And it's going to do a marvelous work and all of that. And uh, so he just raises opposition in the minds of a lot of people. And the end result is that they enter into some kind of conspiracy and uh, steal the record and leave him without it. Now, as a result of that, then, the Lord gave the prophet Joseph Smith section 3 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And uh, in this, he begins with a very important point that all of us need to just read at times. We have our fame, our righteous desires, and so forth, and uh, we, need, we need to read this and apply it to ourselves. The works and the designs and the purposes of God cannot be frustrated, neither can they come to naught. For God doth not walk in crooked paths, and neither doth he turn to the right hand nor to the left, neither doth he vary from that which he hath said. Therefore his paths are straight, and his course is one eternal round. Now the point we should remember is verse 3. Remember, remember that it is not the work of God that is frustrated, but the work of men. For although a man may have many revelations and have power to do many mighty works, if he boasts in his own strength and sets at naught the counsels of God and follows after the dictates of his own will and carnal desires, he must fall and incur the vengeance of a just God upon him. See? So while God doesn't fail, and he doesn't, men may fail and the project may fail, but don't blame it on the Lord. And uh, that's true then, and we all ought to take a leaf out of that one and apply it to our own lives individually, because we can fail, even uh, though the desire may be appropriate and right and a righteous desire. As a result of that then, the German tongue was taken and the plates, and uh, when they're later restored to the prophet Joseph Smith, then he resumes the translation of the Book of Mormon. Now, some people conclude that when he started again, he started on the small plates of Nephi, so that he started at the first of the Book of Mormon as we now have it. Now, this is not true. He continued in his translation into the next book of Mormon's abridgment by the name of Mosiah. He translated through Mosiah, Alma, and Nephi. Now note I didn't say third Nephi. Nephi. And uh, uh, then he uh, he came then to the ministry of the of the Savior, but before we get to that, let me just make this, this observation that uh, in the original 
work of Mormon, there was no first, second, and third, and fourth Nephi, because the, the two Nephi's and the small plates were added later. And if you, you get a copy of the Book of Mormon, and I have a photostat one here just to show you what I mean, when you get over past the Book of Helaman, then you come to a little work called the Book of Nephi, the son of Nephi, which was the son of Helaman. Now that's what we call third Nephi today. And then when you get over past uh, that book and get into what we call uh, the book of fourth Nephi, then it's entitled the book of Nephi, which is the son of Nephi, one of the disciples of Jesus Christ. Now the thing the Lord instructed the prophet to do was to take a special document which Mormon had been inspired to put with the plates. And Nephi earlier had been inspired to write. And we call them the small plates of Nephi. And when Mormon is working on his abridgment, he finds these. And he's very much pleased with what he finds. And he's told by the Spirit of Revelation, put this document with your abridgment. And there's a wise reason for me in, the, in that instruction. See, the Lord has foreknowledge, and he knew Martin Harris was alive, and he knew Martin Harris. And he knew that he was going to have to do something about this thing, see? And so he provided clear back with Nephi in writing the small plates, and then Mormon putting them with the abridgment. So that when Joseph Smith lost the first unit called the Book of Lehi, then he's later instructed to translate the small plates and put them in. And there's a first book of Nephi and a second book of Nephi in those small plates. And that means there are four books of Nephi in the Book of Mormon. And so Orson Pratt came up with the ingenious, uh, uh, inspired view of things of just calling it first, second, third, and fourth Nephi. So that designation is a modern invention comes to us through Elder Orson Pratt of the Quorum of the Twelve. See? But when the prophet Joseph Smith goes back to translate, then he doesn't start with the small plates of Nephi. Rather, instead, he starts with the book of Mosiah. And the Lord here, for example, in verse 10, I mean, section 10, verse 41 of the Doctrine and Covenants, instructs him in relation to the small plates and to put them in. And he says here, verse 41, Therefore you shall translate the engravings which are on the plates of Nephi, that should be the small plates of Nephi, down even till you come to the reign of King Benjamin, note this next phrase now, or until you come to that which you have translated, which you have retained. So he had gone beyond the book of, uh, uh, of Lehi into Mosiah. You see that? Now for corroborating evidence, for example, uh, when the prophet Joseph Smith and Oliver were translating, they came upon the subject of baptism and uh, the conferral of authority by which baptism is a valid ordinance. Now, they found this in the Book of Mormon. Where did they find it? Where did they find it? And the answer is they found it in 3rd Nephi. Now, for example, note Oliver Cowdery's statement of the translation of the Book of Mormon. We have it appended in the, to our scriptures as a kind of a footnote. He says, After writing the account given of the Savior's ministry to the remnant of the seed of Jacob upon this continent, it was easy to be seen, as the prophet said would be, that darkness covered the earth and gross darkness the minds of the people. On reflecting further, it was easy to be seen that amid the great strife and noise concerning religion, none had authority from God to administer the ordinances of the gospel. For the question might be asked, have men authority to minister in the name of Christ to deny revelations when his testimony is no less than the spirit of prophecy and his religion based, built, and sustained on immediate revelations in all ages of the world when he has had a people on earth? He says that these facts were buried and carefully concealed by men whose craft would have been in danger if they were permitted to be uh, to shine in the faces of men. They were no longer to us, and we only waited for the commandment to be given, arise, and be baptized. 
This was not long desired before we realized, before it was realized, the Lord who is rich in his mercy and ever willing to answer the constant prayer of the humble, after we had called him in a fervent manner, upon him in a fervent manner, aside from the abodes of men, condescended to manifest us his will. On a sudden, as in the midst of eternity, the voice of the Redeemer spake peace unto us, and while the veil was parted, the angel of the Lord comes down and confers among the Aaronic priesthood. See? But what have they been doing? Well, they had translated Third Nephi. Now think about that for a minute. Third Nephi is how far along in the Book of Mormon? Well, it's over around, see, there's 500 plus pages, are there not? And third Nephi is close over into the 400 page area. You see that? Now, if they started, if they started in April, and keep in mind, though, that there was a little translated by the prophet before with his wife Emma as a, as a scribe and so forth, but basically they started on the 7th of April, 1829. And they were, by the 1st of July, they were finished with the book by then. From the 7th of April, they translated on through and came through and including the Savior's ministry to the Nephites. Now that's 400 pages. And then, if they had started from the 1st, that would be 400 pages. And then from, April, from uh, May 15th to the end of June, which is an equivalent amount of time, they only had 100 or so pages to do. You see the picture there? All right, but when they start with Mosiah, and you put the small plates last, then you kind of balance out the work. Now, that's one point of importance. Another point of importance deals with the, uh, uh, with the witnesses to the Book of Mormon. Uh, Joseph Smith received a revelation in section 5 of the Doctrine and which was given in March 1829, directed to Martin Harris. And apparently the prophet mentioned to Martin that if he would really repent and apply himself, that he could be one of the witnesses. But the issue really never came to a head until the prophet had translated on the, from the Book of Mormon the instructions concerning witnesses. Now, there's two places in the Book of Mormon where those instructions are found. One is in Second Nephi 27, that there would be witnesses, okay? The other, then, is in... Ether chapter 5, okay? Now, there is an old manuscript dealing then with the witnesses, talking about the prophet then uh, calling them to be such by the direction of the Lord, and making it clear that they had translated Ether chapter 5. And this was the thing they read, and this was the thing that incited their interest to become witnesses. Ether chapter 5. And this was in the latter part of June, 1829. You see that? Now, if they translated the small plates first, they would have got them to that much earlier. You see? So all the evidence then supports the view that when the prophet got the plates back, then he began to translate. He, again, he was in the book of Mosiah and went through Mosiah, through Alma, through Helaman, into Nephi, translated the account of the Savior's ministry, had the question concerning baptism, inquired of the Lord. John the Baptist came May 15th, 1829, almost just a little over a month after Joseph and Oliver had started the translation. They got through that far, see? And then from that point on, they finished the abridgment of Mormon, the writings of Moroni, and then did the small plates as the last word of the translation. Okay? Now, section 17 of the Doctrine and Covenants, and we're going to have to hurry on this. Uh, how much time have we got? Uh, 20 minutes. About 20 minutes, okay. Section 17 is important in that it identifies the items which the three witnesses were to see. And uh, keep in mind that here they... They had a special testimony. Let me go to section 5 of the Doctrine comes with you, first of all. This is this revelation given to Joseph Smith in uh, March of 1829. And there the Lord makes the statement, first of all, that this generation shall receive my word 
through you. And no more true word can, has been spoken. The word of the Lord has, has come to us through Joseph Smith, and almost exclusively so in the sense of revelatory words in the Doctrine and Covenants until recent times. And he says, in addition to your testimony, verse 11, the testimony of three of my servants, whom I shall call and ordain, to whom I will show these things, and they shall go forth with my words that are given through you, yea, they shall know of a certainty that these things are true, and from heaven will I declare it unto them. And note, there's going to be a voice from heaven. And I will give unto them power that they may behold and view these things as they are, and to none else will I grant this power to receive this same testimony among this generation, in this the beginning of the rising up and coming forth of my church out of the wilderness and so forth. Now, none else received this testimony. Does it seem no one else would see the plates? But none else would see the testimony of which he then speaks and which he then describes. Now, when the three witnesses saw the plates, and they saw the angel of the Lord, they heard a voice from heaven declare, this record is true, and it's translated by the gift and power of God. They saw not only the plates, but the brass plates, the Leahona, the sword of Laban, and a few other things see, associated with that. And they were enveloped in glory, and the angel himself showed them to him. There appeared before them, as it were, a, a table. The angel was on one side of it, there on the other and these sacred items are on the table. And the angel takes the record and turns them over one by one so that they see it, and a voice declares this from heaven. Now, later the prophet Joseph Smith showed these, the, the plates alone to eight other witnesses. There was no phenomenal manifestation. He just took them out and set them on a, the trunk of a tree that had been cut off, yea, high, and put them out there and... Uh, and uh, uh, permitted them to stand up there and, and pick them up, heft them, handle them, look them over, turn the leaves, and uh, as I might do or anyone else might do with a book. Here, you want to look at it, look at it, see. And on that basis, then, they saw the record and, the te and appended their testimony. So you have two kinds of testimonies. One is a divine one, and one is from the natural senses. I used to, in my earlier life kind of downplay the eight witnesses. Well, they didn't really see too much, you know. They didn't have the fireworks with it. I don't mean to be sacrilegious on that. But uh, when I was back at Syracuse on my doctoral work, I wrote my doctoral dissertation on Joseph Smith, which is uh, a vain and foolish thing to try and do in the Eastern University, although with the Lord's help I did it without pulling any punches. And uh, in the course of that, I had to tell the story of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon with the witnesses. And I remember my chairman, he read that, what are you trying to do, Andrews? Prove the Book of Mormon's true? And I says, no, Andy, I'm not just trying to give you the, the story and the evidence. And finally the upshot was, well, you can, leave the eight with, you can leave the three witnesses in there, but we don't want you to put the eight witnesses in. And that was a kind of a surprise to me. And I says, why so? He says, well, it's obvious some hallucinations were going on in that three witness stuff. You see, there were some hallucinations there. After all, they heard voices up there, and they saw angels. And they said they were enveloped in some kind of light and glory. And obviously, there was something Joseph Smith did to them. You see, but those eight witnesses, they're hard for an intellectual to discredit. Because you just got good sober men taking a document in their hands and with their five senses, smelling, tasting, doing whatever they can, feeling, seeing, and then bearing testimony. And they didn't want me to put those eight witnesses in. Well, I screwed up my courage and said, hey, look, we're right in the history. The document's there. Take it or leave it. And I got brass, you know, and brazen and courageous, and it stayed. <clears throat> So the eight witnesses in my doctoral dissertation. But uh, it's interesting, the two kinds of testimonies and the appeal that each testimony has and the power that each testimony has, each in its separate ways on various people. You see that? Now, the Book of Mormon is a divine witness of Christ. And the question then, who is Christ? 
And this is one I believe, my brothers and sisters, that we need to re-examine. We have in the church what I sometimes call a, an elder brother syndrome. And uh, it's not so much that, uh, that it's false, it's not false. It's just that it's not as true as it ought to be. Now, it is true that Christ was the firstborn of our Father in Heaven's spirit children. It is true that he is our elder brother in that relationship. But to stop at that point amounts to a denial of Christ, because after having been so born, he went on and he graduated. He went on in his development, and he was appointed to be the only begotten of the Father. He was appointed to be the light and the life of the world. He was appointed to be that being in whom everything that's truth and everything that pertains to salvation centers. And that's what it means, that he's Alpha and Omega and the beginning and the end. And with that appointment, then, he becomes our God and our Father. And so he who was the firstborn by the appointment of the Father becomes our Lord and our God. And it's in this uh, manner of speaking and of understanding things that the Book of Mormon treats Christ. You read the title page, and it begins, for example, telling us the reason for the book, and among other things, it's brought forth, he says, to the convincing of Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, manifesting himself unto all nations. Now, he doesn't say anything about elder brother or anything about the Son of God there. He is the Christ, the eternal God. And this is the view that the Book of Mormon makes. For example, let me turn with you to 1 Nephi 19, where Nephi is talking about Christ and the things that he endured in his afflictions and in his crucifixion. And he says this in verse 10, And uh, the God of our fathers, who were led out of Egypt, out of bondage, and also were preserved in the wilderness by him, yea, the God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, yieldeth himself, according to the words of the angel, as a man into the hands of wicked men, to be lifted up, according to the words of Zenoch, and to be crucified in the words of Nehem, and to be buried in the sepulcher, according to the words of Zanus, which he spake concerning the three days of darkness. Now, who is Christ by Nephi's statement? He's the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Over here in Second Nephi, chapter 11, Jesus uh, uh, is spoke, being spoken of by Nephi. Uh, verse 6, he says, My soul delighteth in proving to my people that save Christ should come, all men must perish. And if there be no Christ, there be no God. But if there be no God, and if there be no God, we are not. For well, there could have been no creation. But there is a God, and he is Christ, and he cometh in the fullness of his time. All right, now, who is Christ? He is God, okay? Over here, for example, in uh, uh, Mosiah chapter 15, and this is the one that uh, Abinadi was burned at the stake for testifying of, uh, having quoted the the great prophetic biography of Christ written by Isaiah 700 years before the birth of Christ or so, then uh, Abinadi says this in verse 1, I would that ye should understand that God himself shall come down among the children of men and shall redeem his people. See? Now, it's not elder brother, it's God himself. When he came down, he was called Emmanuel, which means God with us, does it not? And when the shepherds came to see him, they fell down and worshipped him. And when the wise men came, they worshipped him. And uh, when he appeared to the Nephites, here in 3 Nephi 11, uh, he appeared with this declaration, verse 14, for he invites them, saying, Arise and come forth unto me, that you may thrust your hands into my sides, and also that you may feel the prints of the nails in my hands and my feet, that you may know that I am the God of Israel and the God of the whole earth. 
and have been slain for the sins of the world. See? Now, yes, it's true that Christ is our elder brother, but if that is the extent of your feelings toward him, then your feelings are critically deficient. There is a great difference between the spirit of camaraderie that a brother has for another, as intense and great as it may be, and the spirit that a true saint has when he falls at the feet of Jesus and said, as Thomas did of old, my Lord and my God. There is a difference between the two sentiments and the two feelings, you see. And in that sense, then, it's something like uh, uh, a private soldier in World War II assigned to carry a message to General Eisenhower, and I'm inventing this story. He comes up to the general's tent, knowing that Eisenhower has been a graduate of West Point, and the people graduate with the office of lieutenant. And so he just salutes and says, Lieutenant, I've got a message for you. And there's Ike with five stars sitting on his shoulder. Now, what do you think Ike would do? Well, I think maybe that's what Jesus would do if he vented his feelings of indignation when we merely call him our elder brother. He is our Lord and our God. And the Book of Mormon is here to tell us about that sacred relationship. It's here to tell us about that. And uh, when you hear that expression made too frequently, now it's right that it can be made, and I can quote your President Benson saying it, and I have nothing against that kind of thing. But when that is the limit of our knowledge, then we need to read this sacred book, because its intent and purpose is to prove to both Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ. Now, he's also, besides our God, he's also in some ways our Father. The powers of creation for this earth center in him. These powers of creation are powers of life. As the book of Job says in chapter 32, verse 8, there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of God giveth him understanding. All right, now there's a spirit, there's a physical organism, and then there's a principle of life that quickens and gives us life. And this we call the inspiration of God. Now, there's a father of our spirits. There's a father of our physical body. And there's also a father of that quickening power by which we live and move and have a being. And so when Alma, or Amulet, rather, and uh, Zedrum were having their little legal confrontation, and uh, uh, Amulet testifies that there's only one God, uh, is there more than one God? And he says, no, there's not more than one God. <coughs> and then he goes on to say, how knowest thou these things? And Amulek says, an angel hath made them known unto me. And then he says, who is it that you come? Is it the Son of God? And Amulek says, yes, he's the Son of God. And then speaking of that being who is the only God of this earth by the appointment of the Father, and who is the Son of God, and now who also is the Father of heaven and earth. Then Jesus says he is the Son of God, the very eternal Father. Verse 39, Amulek said unto him, Yea, he is the very eternal Father of heaven and of earth and of all things which in them are. And uh, he is the beginning and the end, the first and the last, and he shall come into the world to redeem his people. And uh, shall take upon him the transgressions of those who believe on his name. Now, who is he talking about? Well, he's talking about Christ. See, he's the one God of the Book of Mormon. And that one God has a Father above him, to whom he prays when he visits the Nephites. But so far as law is concerned, so far as truth is concerned, it's like President Joseph Fielding Smith made clear. He says, the Father, since the time of the fall, has never spoken to man, except to say, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. There has been never a revelation given from the fall of Adam to the present time where God the Eternal Father, the man of holiness, himself personally has dictated that revelation. Rather, instead, 
It has been Christ in the office and power and capacity of the Father. For example, here in section 49 of the Doctrine and Covenants, in verse 5, read with me, Thus saith the Lord, For I am God, and have sent mine only begotten Son into the world for the redemption of the world, and have decreed that he that receiveth them should be saved, and he that receiveth them not shall be damned. Now, who, who is speaking there? It appears as though it's the Father, and it is the Father. But note how he signs his name at the end of the Revelation. Behold, I am Jesus Christ, and I come quickly, even so, amen. Now, the prophet, the, the, the Savior has the authority and power to speak and act and to be just as though he is the Father, and to speak in the name, just and to say, I am the Father, and my only begotten Son I'm going to send into the world. He has that right and that authority, because in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. See? And uh, he then becomes our Lord and our God, and he's our Father, he's the creator of the earth, and the powers of life that quicken and sustain all things on earth come from him, and he is the Father, then a quickening and creative power. And then also he is the Father of those higher endowments of the Spirit by which then we attain eternal life. For example, here in section 25 of the Doctrine and Covenants, and I'm going to have to wind down here right quick. <clears throat> Revelation given to Emma Smith begins with this statement. Hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God while I speak unto Emma Smith, my daughter. For verily I say unto you, all those who receive my gospel are sons and daughters in my kingdom. And then over here in section 34, Revelation given to a young 19-year-old boy by the name of Orson Pratt, who had just been converted to the gospel and went to see the prophet Joseph Smith in at New York, the Lord uh, condescended to give a revelation to Orson Pratt through the prophet. Note how it begins, verse 1. My son, Orson, hearken and hear, and behold what I, the Lord God, shall say unto you, even Jesus Christ, your Redeemer. Now, who's talking to Orson? Christ. And what relationship does Orson have to, to Christ? He's a son. Christ is then who? His father, right? His Father in rebirth and in the regenerating powers of the Spirit. And this is the purpose for which Christ made the atonement. If we don't understand his divine fatherhood, we really don't understand the reason why he made the atonement. He goes on and says in verse 2, I'm the light and the light of the world, the light which shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. Who so loved the world that he gave his own life, and note the reason why, that as many as would believe might become the sons of God. Wherefore, Orson, you are my son. You see, Christ made the atonement like a mother goes through the travail of birth, descending into realms of darkness and agony and pain in order to bring forth life. And then just as she claims that little rascal that's born as her son or daughter, and it was the father's son or daughter before, but she claims it because she travailed and she gave birth. And she gave it the physical attributes along with her husband. You see that? And so they become parents. Now, similarly, Jesus went through the agony of Gethsemane and the agony of the cross in order to open the way into this newness of life of which we spoke this morning, see, that leads finally to eternal life, to the full glory of the celestial kingdom. So that if I stand in the presence of God and am crowned with glory, I'll have the power and light within me like the Father and the Son had in the sacred grove. And all power will be centered in me, not because I've been to enough universities to learn enough, but because of the endowment of the Holy Spirit, the powers of revelation in me, so that then I, I can be on the same level of life as God. And in that sense, Jesus is my Father. I am his son, and the relationship then is that he is our Lord and our God. Now, there's much more that needs to be said on this, but uh, we'll wait till another time. Let me just conclude with my personal testimony that we really do, as a people, as President Benson has said, need to make a dedicated effort to understand the Scripture, the Book of Mormon and other revelations. The time is very, very short, as I see the thing in studying the prophetic picture, 
and those who do not have more than a testimony simply will not stand. Keep in mind that the five foolish virgins, all five of them had testimonies. All five of the foolish virgins had testimonies. But they didn't stand at the midnight hour. And we have been told by a modern prophet that we are under condemnation as a church because we haven't entered into that newness of life and haven't achieved the level spiritually with Christ that we need to achieve. And the situation is critical. And if the scriptures are true and the prophecies of Isaiah in particular, times are coming that are very near at hand when you'll see hundreds and thousands of Latter-day Saints forsake the faith. People who have testimonies but who will not stand because they are under condemnation and haven't by that time got out from under it. So the situation is urgent, my brothers and sisters, critically urgent, and time will vindicate what President Benson has said. We all thought when he came to be our prophet that we are going to get a real blast of politics. And we've all been, some of us, pleasantly surprised. And I say that with my tongue in my cheek because President Benson's politics and political philosophy is as close to the Founding Fathers as any man of modern times. But uh, I was talking to his son Reed, for example, and he says, you know, Dad, he says, just haven't been prompted to say anything on politics. He says, what do you think? Why? And uh, I said, well, I'll give you my personal opinion. First of all, we know what he said in times past. We know that. Secondly, it isn't just a political issue. The issue is spiritual. The issue is our spiritual relationship with Christ. And uh, as I read the major discourses of, of President Ezra Taft Benson, there is revelation in those discourses. There is tremendous revelation in there, which we as Latter-day Saints are letting go by. And that revelation tells us that there is power in the Book of Mormon. There is revelation in the Book of Mormon. Let me, for example, just to give you one statement, and then I'll conclude on this that may be helpful. Here's a, a declaration by him in his uh, uh, tremendous article called The Book of Mormon, Keystone of Our Religion. There is a power in the book which will begin to flow into your lives the moment you begin a serious study of the book. You will find greater power to resist temptation. You will find the power to avoid deception. You will find the power to stay on the straight and narrow path. The scriptures are called the words of life, and nowhere is that more true than in the Book of Mormon. So, so let's recommit ourselves, my brothers and sisters, and may the Lord bless us to that end, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please explain 9319. <clears throat> Section 93, verse 19, you have to read it in relation to the verses before that, and particularly verse 12 and 13, where the Lord talks about Jesus receiving grace for grace in the sense of the endowment powers. And then in verse 19, he says, I give unto these things that you may understand and know how to worship and know what you worship, that you may come unto the Father in my name and in due time receive of his fullness. Now, it's one thing to receive a remission of sins, and it's another thing to grow and mature in the attributes of the Spirit. And uh, we need to do both. But the point is, you, you, we can't really know what we worship until we know the divine nature of Christ. It's not sufficient to know that God is our Father. It's not sufficient to know that we are his spirit children, that he loves us. We need to know something about his divine nature. And if we don't know something about his divine nature, the Lord says in section 93, verse 19 and verse 20, that we neither know how or what we worship. Does knowing that Christ is the God of this earth change your attitude when you pray, or do you still address Elohim as Father? You still address Elohim as Father, but you realize that when that prayer is answered, it will be answered through Christ. And you realize that there is a perfect union, and not just union of feeling, but
beginning of communication between the Father and Christ. And so when you direct your prayers, you pray to the man of holiness, the Father, the Father of our spirits, in the desire to remain in the flesh and do a work in the flesh. And that work really hasn't been done yet. That work pertains to the ministry of the 144,000. That's the little book mentioned in the book of Revelation, chapter 10, where John will prophesy before kings and the nations of the earth. And this is in connection with that great work of gathering, the harvest season, when the elect will be gathered into the church of the firstborn. And John will be involved in that and apparently wanted to be involved in that. And so he's translated to remain and operate in that spirit to bring souls to Christ, as well as to do a lot in between. Was the Yerman Thummim the peak stone mentioned in some histories? And the answer is no. Yet Joseph Smith indeed placed it in a hat when he placed it over his face. The Yerman Thummim operates on a visual principle, like we said. Now, if you have an instrument that operates on a visual principle and you're working in the daylight, the best way to see things in it is to exclude other kinds of light. Now, we don't have definite and definitive knowledge of this, but we do have testimony after testimony by people who were there who said that the prophet had an old white hat, and he put the Yerman thumb inside of it, and then he put his face down to it so that he could see, and then he would dictate. Now, some people think, well, uh, did he study the scriptures? No. The evidence was the scriptures were sitting on the, on the, the table, covered over. Now, the key to understanding that whole thing is this. And when the prophet finally got the plates, he was much more interested in the Yerman Thummim than he was the plates. Now, when he went to the Hill Camorra the first time, he had dollar signs in his eyes, and he was interested in the gold. But when he finally got the plates, he was much more interested in the Yerman Thummim because he says, I can look in this thing and see anything that I want to see. All right, so you don't have to take your head out of that thing and look over here and study then and then go back. You just look in the Yerman Thummim and direct your mind to what you want to see, and you see it. Now, some people say, well, then, Brother Anders, why did they ever take the plates out of the hill? And I say, well, i got an answer for that, if you'll answer me a question. Why did the angel roll the stone away on the tomb where Christ's body was entombed? Why did he roll the stone away? Couldn't Jesus get out? And then they ponder and they scratch their head and say, well, no. Well, then why did they do so? Well, to supply evidence and to operate in the realm of the mortal, and to supply evidence on that basis, see. And so the stolen rolled away and were operating on the base, and Jesus was not there. But he didn't have to wait till the stone got rolled away to get out. Now, similarly. Joseph Smith got those plates from the hill Camorra. He led them around. He fought the mobs. He did a lot of things. But if he just had the urn found, he could have sat in his front room and looked and saw them in the hill Camorra and translated them. Just like he did this document in section 7. That document where, where he, he sees the transcript of material that John the Revelator had written personally. He didn't even have it. And he uh, translated it. All right? But the Lord required him to go through the mortal experience, and this he did. Now, at least that's Hiram Anderson's version of it.